Congress and giving us the opportunity to present this. And, and also, I want to kind of just um, acknowledge what Julia said earlier in that humans and other species are, are we're not engineered organisms and therefore that leaves us susceptible to certain things. And so our susceptibility over the course of evolution is it's a consequence of a number of things. One is, is that we haven't had maybe, let's say in humans case, enough time to fully adapt to an environment and things are even worse because environments constantly change on us. Um, as well as, as the main important or the most important point to that being we are not as a set of engineered species, and so therefore we are not perfect. And so today, um, if you missed the, the my five minute spiel this morning about general genomics, what I'm going to be talking about today is one use of this novel platform technology that we, we use in our lab that uh, consists of analyzing modern sequences in an evolutionary context and inferring what the ancient sequences of um, that gave rise to the modern sequences are and how we can exploit those ancient sequences for technological development, whether it's uh, industrial enzymes, agricultural enzymes, or biomedical enzymes. And so the, what we're going to talk about today is how we can use this notion of ancient proteins to be able to potentially treat a human condition, and in this case, to be able to treat gout or uh, prevent tumor lysis syndrome. So um, some of you probably know that gout is a form of inflammatory arthritis. Maybe you have family members that have been afflicted by uh, this. And, 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 and gout is caused by the buildup of uh, urate monosodium crystals in the joints. These are highly insoluble. This is a highly insoluble molecule, and it causes um, much pain in the patient. Here we have an example of um, the buildup of the urate crystals. It, it, it most, this mostly takes place in the distal joints. Joints. So there are about uh, more than 10 million sufferers worldwide. There's been a, a large increase in prescriptions over the past decade, especially as the baby boomers age, um, they're, they're afflicted by this. And so uh, the reason that they're afflicted by this is because humans don't have an enzyme, a functional enzyme capable of uh, degrading or hydrolyzing uric acid. And so if we just follow pretty quickly here this biochemical pathway, um, uric acid is mostly produced by the uh, purine catabolism. So if we have um, purines up here, these are catabolized down to uric acid. And so the normal substrate for uh, uricase enzyme is uric acid here. And so we don't have this though. We don't have this fun functional enzyme, excuse me, in humans, as well as some other species, such as birds, uh, the Dalmatian dog, and some reptiles. And so because we don't have this enzyme, we cannot convert this highly insoluble uric acid into the far more insoluble, actually, 5 hydroxy so uric, which is subsequently uh, changed into a, a lantern. And so because of that, then, there's this need to be able to manage the buildup of uric acid in it. And in the past, probably, this was not an issue because of uh, the diets that ancient humans had. Now, as diet, as I mentioned, environments change, certain diets change, and so because of this, we now actually ingest more of the precursors for uric acid in our diets, and therefore we are susceptible to the buildup of uric acid and such things as that gout. And so how do we manage this? So historically, um, uh, small molecule therapies have been used to manage gout, so uh, the most popular is allopurinol, which is Oxidase inhibitor, so xanthinoxidase is the enzyme immediately upstream of, uh, of uricase, which is producing the uric acid. So if, we, if, we, uh, if we're able to inhibit the production of uric acid, then we can uh, deal with the gout. And so the problem, though, is that there, there are a number of side effects associated with the small molecule therapies. And so because of that, pharmaceutical companies have been interested in developing protein-based therapies against gout. And two such examples of this are Elitec and Cristexa. Um, and if we kind of walk through what these are. So Elitec here is a yeast. So this is a, a micro-based uricase. And it's had, it gets sales of about 380 million uh, 
of dollars. This was a number of years ago. The problem with this, as I mentioned, it's a yeast case. It's highly aminogenic, and therefore you can't inject it multiple times into the human body unless you have a way of masking that foreign protein from the immune system in humans. In, in addition, most recently, uh, protein-based uricase is Cristexa, and it's, it may be expected to have peak sales of more than a billion, although they're having a difficult time getting off the ground with this. This was approved by the FDA a couple of years ago now. But what they what they discovered is that physicians don't really want to give their patients this drug um, based pretty much on this, this problem that during clinical trials, almost 20% of patients discontinued the use due to adverse side effects, as well as uh, more than 50% of patients didn't even meet the clinical endpoints associated with the, um, with the studies. And this is related to the immunogenicity of, of this engineered uricase. And so if we just kind of get a broad overview of what's going on here with, with uricases, um, as I mentioned, it, microbial uricases have been used to uh, inject into humans. So in this case, we have Elitec, which is a, a yeast um, uricase as well. But, so this is an unmodified, but it's since been pegylated. If you're familiar with this notion of uh, polyethylene glycols can be added to proteins in order to um, mask an immune response in humans. And as I mentioned also, the most recent development is Cristexa, which is a recombinant pegylated uricase. And this der derives from a chimer between a pig and a baboon uricase. And we don't actually really know why, pharmaceutical, why a particular pharmaceutical company has uh, developed this chimer. Now, there's the notion, though, that potentially that if we develop a therapeutic protein, whose protein sequence is more similar to a human sequence, then maybe that, ther that engineered therapeutic protein could evade an immune response better. Okay, so how does that fit into to the uricase? Well, so human uricase contains two premature stop codons. Okay. Potentially, if you could read through those two stop codons, you would actually make a full-length protein. Now the problem though, from, from a clinical perspective, you could say, well Eric, why don't you just replace those two stop codons in the human gene, and then use that as a therapeutic. Well, we've tried that, it doesn't work. Because the protein has accumulated mutations over time that not only has it accumulated the stop codons, but it's also accumulated deleterious mutations at the amino acid level that preclude the, uh, a functional human uricase protein if you just swapped out the stop codons. Okay, so we're back to this pig baboon chimer from Cristexa. What they've done is they've taken about 75% of the pig and about 25% of the baboon sequence. Made this chimer, they've pegylated it, then they've, uh, they've passed through um, clinical trials and approved by the FDA. But as I mentioned, it's, it's, it's not an extremely, um, it's not a very good therapeutic to be able to treat gout. Okay. So where does that leave us? Well, so we, we use this evolutionary-based approach whereby we consider um, modern sequences in some sort of historical context to be able to uh, infer an ancient uh, DNA sequence or an amino acid sequence. And so if you just consider, say, this Christexa example, here we have uh, different species that either have an active uricase or have an inactive uricase, so we, along with all the other greater apes and lesser apes, don't have a functional uricase. Whereas our uh, closest relatives outside the apes, the monkeys, they do have a functional uricase. It's not a very active uricase, but it is a functional uricase. And so this company, as I mentioned, uh, that has created Christexa, they created this chimer between pig and baboon. The pig is very active, the baboon is not very active, but yet maybe the combination of the two would allow you to invade the immune response better. So what we do then is we, we don't consider just two species. We consider a lot of species. We put all of these uh, species sequences into a phylogenetic framework. We infer an ancestral protein. Now, before I show you the results of, of that, let me just kind of drive home this notion of what we are doing here. We are taking modern sequences, okay, we are aligning those sequences, we're analyzing them in an evolutionary context, and so that's most often 
consists of building what's called a phylogenetic tree. And then we have algorithms that can infer the ancient sequences and all of these nodes on the phylogenetic tree here then. So once we computationally do that, we then build the sequences in the laboratory, and then we recombinantly express those ancient sequences in a modern organism or an in vitro translation system. And then we purify the protein and test the activities of these ancient proteins. So before I get into um, the, the specific properties of our ancient uricase sisters, it's kind of important to know that uricase naturally within mammals does not exist as a soluble protein. So uricases are um, translocated to the peroxisome, where the uricase uh, is, composes the crystalloid core of the peroxisome. So here we have an insoluble mass of protein that makes up the core of the peroxisome. Now from a therapeutic standpoint, this is not a good starting off point because you want to be able to inject a soluble protein, not an insoluble protein. So it turns out though that you can actually, um, you can solubilize uricase, and I'll get to that in a second here. So if we just look now for, at the moment, we look at the amount of active protein in the insoluble portion of these ancient proteins as they are recombinantly expressed in modern bacteria. So we're looking at specific activity of insoluble fraction as, as determined by the uh, animals of, of urea hydrolysis per minute per made of total protein. And what we see here is that if we go to the uh, mammalian ancestor here, that we have a fairly active ancient uricase. And as we travel along the portion of the phylogenetic tree that leads to uh, the great apes and the lesser apes, what we see here is that the uricase begins to decrease in activity. Okay, just for perspective, the the pig uricase uh, has, a, has about a, a comparable uh, activity as to our ancient uricases here. So now, as I mentioned, though, we, we want to be able to deal with the soluble protein, but uricases naturally are not soluble. And so if you just, uh, you can supply a very high pH buffer to the uricases to get them to solubilize. And so when we do that with our ancient uricases, and then we're able now to then, once we solubilize, we can measure such things as this KK or KM to get an idea of the catalytic efficiency of the protein. And so when we do this, here we have just the conditions of the assays here. Um, when we do this, we see that we see this precipitous drop. And of course, as we expect, the enzymatic um, activity of the ancient uricases. And so if we just, uh, let's say, let's start off with here with pigs, so we have about three times 10 to the six, and then um, this Christexa, which is the pig baboon chimer, is about two times 10 to the six, and that is pretty comparable to our most active ancient uricase, which is about one times 10 to the six. And notice, though, that if we travel along again the evolutionary portion of the tree that leads to humans, we're seeing this big hit in the catalytic efficiency of the protein. We're going from about 10 to the 6, we go, and then we hit 10 to the 5, 10 to the 4th, and then we could not determine, obviously, the catalytic efficiency of these year cases because we couldn't solubilize them. And so that, that leads us to um, focus then on these ancient year cases down here in this portion of the tree. In particular, this, um, this year case that's represented right here on the tree is actually this this ancestral uricase and this ancestral uricase that have the exact same sequence. And so we focus then on that portion of, of the evolutionary space, the historical space, and we're now trying to develop that particular ancestral uricase to be able to, uh, to treat uh, gout, whereby we are trying to develop a uricase that is very catalytically active, as well as potentially being able to avoid this immune response that's occurring within the human. So the first thing we've done along these lines is we've taken our, um, our ancestral uricase that we're focusing on, and so that's represented by ancestral node 19 in the tree, so it has this nomenclature of AN19 or ANC19. And what we've done is we've injected this, uh, this ancient uricase into SD rats and compared that to SD rats that were also given the Christexa form, the pig baboon chimer, not the pigulated portion of the form of that protein, but just the, the pig and baboon uricase chimer. 
And what, what we are able to show is that our, ans our ancestral engineering the area case is actually a lot more stable when it's administered into the rodents, and in this case, into the rats. And so you know, when we first got this result, um, one of the first things we did was we wanted to make sure that we could verify that we're actually injecting the same amount of protein for PVC, the pig bedroom chimer, as well as the ancestral 19. We confirmed that multiple times. We were able to confirm that the activity of the pre-injected urine cases were not biased in any way as to lead us to, um, to get this large difference here. So we're confident that the rats were given the same amount of protein that in, in between PVC and Ancestor 19, and that those two uh, injections were of the comparable catalytic activity. And so what we see here, though, that our ancestral protein is almost an order of magnitude uh, in terms of the remaining activity compared to this PVC, which is in its pegylated form given to, uh, to, to humans to treat gout. So where we are currently right now is we're testing various pegylation strategies, um, and then we, are, we will be injecting those pegylated urine cases into, into rats in the, the coming weeks. So with that then, um, particular thanks to James Kratzer here, sitting also in the back of the room, who, um, who's, who's done all of this work, and James was supported by uh, Andy and Mark Center here at CD4, as well as Georgia Research Alliance School of Biology, Tiger Program at Georgia Tech, uh, Georgia Tech Research Institute, as well as what I mentioned this morning, we are now being funded by Peter Thiel's foundation with the breakout labs. And so with that, I thank you for your time. What models do you use to demonstrate efficacy for gout disease? Well, so the closest thing that is, is used in the field is there is a urine case knockout mouse that uh, dies within about six days if you, don't, if you can't treat the uric acid. And so those, uh, those mice are fed a diethylpyranol to keep them alive. And so the standard test is and the adults stop feeding the computer and start feeding the urine cases. And so uh, that's the extent of um, how, to our knowledge, how a uh, urine case gets on the market. Beyond that, I don't have any particular uh, animal gut models. Is it even why the monosodium you create just to inject it in your joint and see it flares up and then look for it? Yeah, so the, the, the people have those information. Yeah, they'll inject uh, the monotonium variants into, into rats mm -hmm. uh, to follow. Uh, the problem with that, is, though, is that you don't have this long term buildup, which is not analogous to how it builds up in the humans, but yeah, you can certainly follow uh, the people. What's the dosing measurement that's acceptable for complications for injecting it? What's the most? Dosing measurement. How oh, often can you inject them? Um, James, do you know the answer to this? I do, like well, once a, every two weeks or four weeks, depending on the events. So, the are stacks that they come in for a dose once every two weeks. That's what you want to say, James, to increase your heart rate. Yeah, and it's actually interesting from our perspective. Um, you know, we don't. So, the human protein is not very active, we know this. But what if it turns out that the hu human protein does not elicit an immune response at all? Okay, sure, it's not active, but it's never degraded by the body. So in that case, you would want to be able to engineer the human protein, potentially. Um, we, we can't test humans for this, but what our intentions are is and there are some very sophisticated B cell and T cell assays that you can use to look for at least innate immunity towards your case. Because you know, if you read through the, the two stop codons while you're developing the image, you're just going to build a complex, and maybe you see that protein as a cell protein and you can inject it to your blue face, and there will be no immediate immunological response. You would also look at antibody responses in the case of. Yeah, yeah.